The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Dr. Karen Wyatt is a family physician who spent much of her 25-year career as a hospice medical director caring for dying patients in their homes. Dr. Wyatt has lectured and written extensively on end-of-life issues with an emphasis on the spiritual aspect of illness and dying. Although she doesn't remember the details, Karen stopped breathing at age five long enough to have possibly experienced an NDE. The suicide death of her father many years later, uh, triggered a deep depression, even though he spoke to her and apologized for hurting her. And that depression only began to lift as she got into her work with hospice patients. Dr. Wyatt is the host of the popular podcast, End of Life University. That's EOLuniversity.com. She lives in Colorado with her husband, Dr. Larry George, and enjoys hiking and cycling in the beautiful Rocky Mountains. Karen is also the author of the book, Seven Lessons for the Living from the Dying. And specifically, those seven lessons and the short answers are built right into the chapter titles, which I want to read to you because it's a really interesting way to present the book. For example, chapter one, suffering, embrace your difficulties. Love, let your heart be broken. Forgiveness, hold no resentments. Presence, dwell in the present moment. Purpose, manifest your highest potential. Surrender, let go of expectations. Impermanence, face your fear. Karen, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you, Lee. It's a pleasure to join you today. Oh, it's wonderful to hear hear you uh, and and uh, your very clear signal right out of the Rockies. I I, I think that's terrific. Um, so much better than doing the show by telephone. Yes, yeah, this is wonderful. <laughs> Karen, you and I have shared similar backgrounds. You as a hospice MD and me as an EMT on an ambulance and then later as a hospital chaplain, both dealing with the questions and the answers the dying offer up to us, uh, us remaining behind on earth for the moment. Also, I had an NDE at seven, and you may have had one at age five when you stopped breathing. And you've said your father's suicide engendered a deep sense of failure in you, even though he spoke to you and apologized. But then you discovered your healing work in hospice. And given the structure of your book and your podcast, End of Life University, I thought I'd try something new for us on NDE Radio. And that is dedicate a show to role-playing with me as a hospice patient facing death with many questions on my mind and you as the visiting doctor with the wisdom of empathy and experience. Now, some of our answers we have learned by listening and listening to the thoughts and visions of patients who've gone before. And, of course, some of these questions are impossible to answer fully, I know, but uh, we hear these questions anyway, so please, as we do when it happens in real life, just give it your best shot. So I'm a... Um, let's say I am a stage four cancer, uh, victim, uh, and it's been recommended that I'm go into hospice and there I am. And you come in, you come in to see me. Doc, I'm so glad you, you're here. Please sit down. I've got a million questions to ask you. Doc, why is this happening to me? That is one of the questions that everyone asks when they reach a stage such as this, but one for which we don't have an answer necessarily. We, we may not have the type of answer that you would like to hear in terms of a cause for what's happening or the effect of it. But what I've learned is that all of the difficult experiences that we have in life have within them the gem of something wonderful and transformative that we can learn. And so Rather than trying to understand what caused this or what brought you to this point, I invite people to just look at where you are right now and focus on what might I be able to learn from the situation that I'm in and and how can I take away something that's positive 
or healing or beautiful or ins inspirational for me out of this experience. Mm. But what will happen to my family if I die? They're count they count on my being here. Well, that's something also that you you have to let go of worrying that, about that a little bit because you can you can do the best you can in terms of taking care of paperwork and managing your finances to leave for them, but everyone at some point or another deals with having a loved one die, and that ends up being one of those experiences on their path where they will struggle through saying goodbye and then learning to live without you in their day-to-day -day lives in a physical sense in the future. So you have to honor your own path and where you are and accept that this is what's what's right for you, what's coming for you at this time in your life. And that as challenging as it is to view that for your family, there will also be one day some healing and, and reconciliation around it. Mm. Well, is this the end of everything for me or am I going somewhere? Well, it depends on your what you believe, I would say. What I believe and what I've experienced with my hospice patients is that there's something way beyond this physical existence. And if we look at it, it's a it's a truth of the universe that energy cannot be destroyed or created. And we are essentially energy. We're, we're energy housed in this physical form. And so I view death as just a transformation of that energy. It, you your, your spiritual essence, your energy will leave the physical form that you're in, but goes on to a new form, a, a spiritual form after you die. Now, what that looks like and what that consists of, I don't know for sure, but patients have told me when they have taken a step or looked at that time after life that it's beautiful and full of light and full of love. And so that's what that's kind of what I what I believe in and what I I am hoping for at the very least for the end of my life. Uh, so I won't just be a ghost hanging around watching my family, huh? Well, I don't know about that for sure. I have been I've been told by people that sometimes after death spirits can be present with their family and observe their family and witness them and I've definitely had visitations from some of my family members who've died in my dreams particularly. I've I've seen them and I've talked with them and so I believe that it's possible for us to stay in contact with them. But I also think there's something more than that for us to do after we die, that when we get into that spiritual realm, there's something, there's other work for us or other things that we might focus on as well. I, I went to your website and I saw that uh, you say your father talked to you after, after he'd committed suicide. What was that like? Yes, it happened. First, the very first time was actually the night after he died, and I, I laid awake um, crying all night, and I heard his voice say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. And um, at the time, I, I, I recognized that he wasn't intending to hurt me by what he did. He was doing what was nest what he needed to do at that time. He didn't mean to hurt me, but what was going through my head is, yes, but you did hurt me. <laughs> you did hurt me. And so um, that was the very first experience. And then a few other times I've had dreams of my dad coming, but always with great love and always he all, each time I could see him and he was much younger than the age he was when he died and beautiful, full of light and full of love. And each time he came in a way to almost embrace me. He came at times when I was maybe going through something a little bit difficult and he was just there shining and reaching out to me with just with pure love in, in each one of those dreams. And it was uh, incredible for me, very inspiring. Wow, that makes me feel really good. Uh, do you think I'll be able to, to visit my family or, or have them see me or hear me when, after I die? I have to say, I believe that it's possible. I, I definitely believe that it can happen. I, I can't say I, I guarantee it, but I, I believe that it can. And I think part of it may have to do also with when your family is ready for that to happen and open to it. So depending on, on how your family progresses 
at that time? Um, how receptive are they and how open are they and will they be able to see it? But I believe that if they want the connection and you do too, that it can definitely happen. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'm regretting is that there have been so many family quarrels left unsettled and uh, I just don't know what to do about that. Well, one thing I found for most of the patients that I work with at the very end of life forgiveness, even though it seems like such an impossible task as we're moving through our lives at the end of life, sometimes forgiveness can happen very, very quickly in an instant. And all it may take is just an opening and just a moment to talk with a family member. If they're present, if you're able to do that and to say, I'm sorry for anything that happened between us. I want to let go of all of that. I want you to only remember love right now between us. And it can also happen if it's someone who's distant from you that you can't speak to. Even if it's someone who's already died, you can still in your mind envision that you're having that conversation and that you're saying, um, I apologize if there's anything I've done to hurt you and I want to feel only love right now. And then also, if you want to say, I forgive you for things that you did and said, and I, I want only to experience love between us right now. Mm -hmm. Well, I know, it, it, gosh, it sounds good, but how can I forgive my brother when I'm still so angry at the way he treated me? I think the place to begin initially is to Try to, first of all, acknowledge your feelings. Why do you feel hurt like this? What happened and why do you feel so hurt? And then try to understand from your brother's perspective, what do you know of him and where he was when that experience happened? What was, was he going through? What was life like for him at that moment? And is there any possible way that you can let go of some of the blame that you have for him? One thing that that I have used as a little tool for myself is that the first thing I say when I'm feeling a lot of bitterness or anger to another person is, what if this is all me? The reason I say that is because I first want to look at what within me, what pain am I holding that causes me to see the other person's actions as hateful and hurtful toward me? Am I holding on to pain that distorts how I view the other person and what their intentions are and how they behave? So that first, if you can first look within, forgive yourself and, and clear yourself of, of pain that you might be holding on to that might be distorting how you see the world. Sometimes that helps because sometimes you might realize that part of you believes that you deserve to be mistreated by another person because you feel guilty about something. And if you can start there and let go of any negative feelings you have toward yourself, that can help you get to a place where it's much easier to see the other person's perspective and understand what they might have been experiencing. And sometimes that's all it takes to open the door to, to forgiveness. Well, I will give it a try. Doc, here's a crazy question. If I if they cremate my body, what happens to me? What will I look like on the other side? You you know the what I believe is that and what I've experienced is that your soul doesn't itself by itself doesn't really necessarily have an appearance. It's like light, um, but it can take on a physical form, the physical form that you had and look like your physical form when you were here on earth, regardless of what happens to the physical body, because the, the you've let go of the body. It's as if you've taken off the clothing that you were wearing and whether it's buried and decomposes there or um, is cremated and goes back to ashes into the earth that form doesn't matter anymore if once you're in a spirit the form of a spirit then you can take on the appearance like my father my father who appeared to me only much much younger than he was when he died you you can take on that physical appearance and uh, so that when you appear to someone who's still on earth they'll recognize you and know who you are was your father cremated no he wasn't he was buried Mm. Wow. 
You know, Doc, I haven't lived a, a very good life. Is, do you think there's a hell? Is it scary? Do you think I'll suffer after I die? I can tell you that of all of the patients that I've been with at the end of life as they were dying, not one of them told me, because I'll, I'll tell you this, a lot of them reported to me in the last days of life, they seem to be moving back and forth um, between this realm and the spiritual realm on the other side. And so when they would come back and open their eyes and be able to talk to me, not one of them described anything negative, described anything that I would think of as a hell. All of them described beauty and light and love as what they were experiencing when when they saw the other side, what was waiting for them to come to. So I think of if there is any sort of a hell, it might be something that we experience here on planet Earth when we're in physical bodies and when we view ourselves as separate from everything that's spiritual, as if we, we put ourselves into a hell of sorts by separating ourselves and um, not being connected with the spiritual aspect of life. So maybe whatever is hell, perhaps it's something we already experienced at some time in our life and it's not what's waiting for us after we die. Mm. Well, I'm sure not ready to be judged. I, I really don't feel worthy. I, I wonder, should I ask people to pray for me? I, I think that's fine um, for one reason, because it may help the people, if it, uh, it may help your loved ones if they feel that they're doing something. But I, I wouldn't um, suggest that they pray to make sure you don't go to hell. I see that as kind of an a notion that I, that I don't see as necessary. You stand on your own and you, you are your own person on your own path. But I think it can actually sometimes help other people if they believe in prayer, if they use utilize prayer um, for someone they love at the end of life. It's just a way of communicating and sending love and in a way being in a, a meditative spiritual space that I think could be helpful. But I did want to say to you that whatever has happened in your life in the past has been just part of the path that you've been on, part of the experiences life has brought to you for you to learn from. And the learning doesn't stop. You're still learning to now, now in every moment of every day that you're here. And so no matter what the past has consisted of, it doesn't change, it doesn't, doesn't doom you, it doesn't, it's not something that you will carry with you in any moment. You can learn and you can grow and you can transform even right now at, at this place where you are at, at the end of your life. And I want to just tell you one quick story about a patient we had on our service who had been we, well, we would have called him a hobo in the past or a vagabond, a, a man who was, he was homeless, but he rode the rails. He rode on trains around the country and you know, hit out on rail cars and would get off in various places and live, live by the railroad. And he had lived a really hard life. He'd done a lot of things that he felt bad about and had a lot of regrets for the way he had lived his life. But just before we were expecting him to die because he had kidney failure. We didn't think he'd live more than two weeks. He start, He got a spiral notebook and a pencil, and he started drawing pictures of things he had seen in his travels around the country on the railroad. And it turns out he was an amazing artist, and he discovered this as he was in the midst of his own dying process. And the fact is he actually went on to live an entire year and he drew pictures every single day of that year so that he himself had this little opportunity at the end of life to become an artist and to explore his own artistic ability before he died. And so it was a complete transformation in who this man was. And it was such grace and such a blessing for him, but also for us to get to experience that with him and be on the path with him as he, as, as he had really that miraculous transformation. Wow. That's a wonderful story. You know, I tell people I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. And uh, in thinking about it, I've, I really don't know what that means, but that story 
somehow gives me a, a more of an understanding of spiritual. And is that is that how you understand it? Yes, I I have come. I mean, I began my early life as I would say religious with quotes around it because I was raised in a church in a religion, but. I began to see at some point that the religion was something that humans created in order to understand or explain God and spirit and to know how to relate to God and spirit and how to relate to one another. And it felt to me as if I graduated from religion into spirituality, that at some point I had learned enough that I didn't fit or belong within the constraints of any one religion anymore. I could see truth in all of the religions, and I saw how all of the religions were doing their best to describe God from different perspectives, but that I was now having experiences that went way beyond just what religion could offer to me. So that's that's how it appeared to me, and, and I have... Um, had that perspective for many, many years. And I agree with you in that story. I feel that that was also a spiritual experience. It didn't have to do with religious knowledge or religious dogma or being part of any sort of church. Mm. Wow. Thank you. That's, that, was a, that was a good answer. Um, here's a serious question, though. My, my dead uncle molested me. Do I have to see him on the other side? I don't, I, you know, I, I don't know for sure how to answer that, but I can say that at some point you may have the opportunity to forgive what has happened in the past and to let go of whatever pain that you're carrying about your uncle and whether or not it would involve seeing him or connecting with him. I don't know. And, and it, it's possible that you would discover that there's more something more to the story than you even know and that even that horrible awful experience that i'm sure has has caused you so much pain and left you with terrible wounds that you carry but there's a possibility that even those wounds have been part of shaping you into the person that you are today. So not to say that that makes it okay or right that your uncle did that, but to have a new perspective that your path intersected with your uncle's path in a way that was very hurtful to you, not because you deserved it, not, not for any reason like that whatsoever, but that even that terrible experience may have within it a gem, like I was saying before, or an opportunity to grow in a way. Um, perhaps you've developed compassion for other people who've been hurt and harmed by their loved ones. Perhaps you have deeper insight into what is it like to live your life carrying that kind of wound and pain, and how do you how do you go through each day with that wound and still find love and joy in life? So perhaps there has there is a way. If you don't see it now, perhaps at some point there will be a way to see some sort of a blessing even within that terrible experience. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a related question. Will God be there to answer my questions uh, about why he didn't fix things? Well, what, what I understand of God is that God doesn't really intervene in our lives and fix things to make things perfect for us in our lives, that our spiritual existence here on earth, we're, we're in relationship, we're part of, we're a manifestation of God and of this, this spirit, but it's really about us living the best we can and going through these encounters. And so I do believe that after death, once we're outside of these human brains, which in some ways are very limited, how we can look at and experience what is spiritual and what is divine is somewhat limited because our brains don't necessarily allow us to have that consciousness, unless maybe we've had a near-death experience or something that has opened us up to it. So I believe that after we leave these human bodies and we're outside of the limitations of the human brain, suddenly we will have clarity of sight and we will be able to look 
look at these lives we've lived and things that have happened to us, and it will make sense. We will see the patterns that form. We'll see how things were connected. We'll see the beauty, even in painful, ugly things, and how they led perhaps to something else that um, that was amazing or very important in our lives. And so I think that clarity comes, and maybe that is if that is because we're even more connected to God, so we will experience those answers and be able to see them. Wow. Is God really love? And what does that mean? To me, I, I would say yes to that to that question. And interestingly, I think that is the very first thing that I learned when I was a little child going to Sunday school, (laughs) that God is love. And so at that, it's really interesting to me when I think, oh gosh, I learned the one major thing of my whole life when I was like three years old. Isn't that interesting? Um, But I see love I think our human experience of love also is fairly limited and we tend to think of love as romantic love, finding someone in a person in our lives to love or some, maybe for some it's a pet to love. And we think of love as this exchange that we have with another living being. But uh, I view love as something so much greater than that, that love is the creative force of the universe it's the it's the it's it's a name for all that is all that is creative all that leads to everything in existence all that brings about life and and creates life and so to me that is god but that is also love and that love in a way is the the action of God, it's the verb for God, I guess, and the way that God creates and brings about and manifests is through love. So when I look at love in my lifetime now, my human lifetime, I'm always trying to see that bigger picture of what love is so that I don't limit myself to love just being something I exchange with other humans, but something even bigger. It's participating in this creative act of God um, that that supports life and nourishes life. And so that's the that's the kind of love that I want to be connected to and be part of. Mm, me too. Well, Doc, I guess this is my final question then. What, what, will I come back here again? Is is there reincarnation? And and if there is, will I be a person or an animal? And does that depend on how I lived my life before? Do I get to choose? I I can't, you know, I can't say that for sure that I, out of experience or remembered experience of my own, but I have a strong sense, you know, I mean, if you look at a human lifetime and the fact that we all develop through various stages in our lifetimes, so we go from being an infant to a toddler to um, an older child and an adolescent adult, we go through these stages of development. And I believe that our souls have their own process of development. And so in our lifetimes, our souls that are embodying our physical form are actually here learning lots of lessons, soul lessons that the, that the soul needs to know and that the soul can only learn by being a human, by being a human that is born and then will die one day and a human that experiences suffering and loss and difficulties. So I see that our souls are learning and developing in the same way that we do in our human form. And it makes sense to me that one lifetime is probably not nearly enough time for the souls to learn everything that can possibly be learned through life on this planet. So it makes sense to me that we would have more than one opportunity to come here for this learning experience. Maybe Earth is like a graduate school or something <laughs> that we say we enroll in and sign up for to come. And maybe uh, maybe we choose different lives in different places so that we can have different experiences and learn different things. That idea just endlessly fascinates me. I love thinking about it, but I, I don't I don't I can't say that I have an answer for it because I myself don't have memories of any of another life, but I do I expect that that will happen. I expect and assume that I've been here many times before. And um, I kind of came here uh, even as a child with some of the spiritual 
knowledge and wisdom that I have, some of that was here with me when I was born and when I came here. So I believe I had to have learned that and acquired it in other lifetimes and other experiences on the planet. So that's my wow. way of not really <laughs> answering the question. But <laughs> No, no. Well, doctor, you are a wonderful doctor. You're so much better than so many of the doctors I had to work with at the hospital. Uh, thank you so much. This has been terrific. I was going to say, uh, most doctors would probably not answer a lot of those questions. <laughs> I know. They turn around and walk out of the room, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Nurses would tend to be more uh, patient with the patient and yes. understanding and, yes, and, definitely. and volunteer the answers. But thank you. you. You gave splendid answers. You, I, I have to tell the audience you had no list of the questions before I asked them. So this was all uh, this was all an, an honest reaction on your part, too. Yeah, you you inspired me <laughs> with your questions. Thank you for asking them. <laughs> well, this is wonderful. I, I also want to tell folks. Um, you have a, an eight-part series on your dad's suicide and, and how you transitioned through it. Is that available on your website? Yes, it's part of my pot from my podcast. I did I recorded this series and it was kind of like an investigative series of looking back at my dad's life to help me understand what was his life like, you know, what might have led him to to choose to to end his life. So in each of the parts I I looked at various times in his life, I learned as much as I could from his sisters and from, you know, other other people who knew him and from looking back at like his records in the army and, and things like that to try to put together these various experiences of his life that I think may have contributed to his decision um, to end his life. And then also, I was also describing my own journey at each of those stages and how I was dealing with grief. So it's called Suicide, Surviving the Aftermath. And if you go to eoluniversity.com, um, it is under, let me see, now I can't remember. The, uh, there's uh, uh, forward slash suicide, suicide series. Suicide series, yes, yep. thank you. Suicide series. And so there's a link there to each one of the eight episodes. And again, it's it's part of my podcast, so it takes you into the podcast files and the show notes. And so you can read some things there. Right. And it was a, an extremely powerful thing to do. And... Um, Wow, very, very I, healing. I, I think it would be a, a, a wonderful pattern for other people who've been seriously affected by a family suicide to, to listen to and, to and to work through themselves in the same way you did. Karen, unfortunately, we are out of time for today. Um, I assume that they can find on your website your book, Seven Lessons for the Living from the Dying. Yes, my book okay. is there. Yeah, and Ter links to the podcast and terrific. Podcast. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again for for being on NDE Radio. And, Thank you. Um, um uh, I want to tell my audience, uh, don't forget to keep using your phone or social media to check in on those folks you think might benefit from having someone to talk to during this time of COVID. Uh, please stay masked and stay well. Until next Monday. 11 a.m. Eastern, this is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening. <laughs>